Good morning. I am Kevin Price. Delighted to be with you. Going to spend some time talking to you about you and your business. It's your business to uh, really understand what's going on with the way our, our young people are taught, uh, the way they learn uh, about uh, the world in which they live in, at least in my opinion it is. And uh, really have enjoyed. I, I, I had Stephen Meyer on a couple of weeks ago, uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, he's back again by popular demand, if not by others, definitely by me, but actually others, you know, are saying, especially on social media, they loved my interview when we promoted it on social media. Uh, it's always great to get someone who's thoughtful and really wants to look at, at the entire picture. And uh, I really believe, Stephen, uh, in your book, uh, Darwin's Doubt, um, I don't think you have a, an agenda other than truth. That's the impression I get. Well, yeah, we'd really like to get scientists to look at the evidence carefully and follow it where it leads and not have uh, be, be kind of constrained by a, a pre-established uh, conclusion. And unfortunately, when we look at this issue of biological origins, there's a, there's a convention that constrains the way many scientists think. The convention has a fancy name. It's called methodological naturalism, but that just means that no matter what the evidence says, you've got to interpret it as if a strictly materialistic explanation is the explanation for how life arose. And mm -hmm. what we're looking at in life increasingly are, uh, are kinds of evidences that we know from our own experience only arise from intelligent causes rather than undirected material causes. And in particular, I'm talking about the digital code that's stored in the DNA molecule and the whole complex information processing system that uh, is at work inside cells, when we encounter the, these types of effects in any other realm of experience, we immediately recognize the activity of a mind being behind them. So right. Uh, right. that's the, the, the convention that scientists feel duty-bound to, to obey, if you will, is directly at odds with our own experience-based knowledge of what it takes to build systems such as the ones we see at work inside living cells. Yeah, you know, and I, I almost think a, 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 a better term than uh, a methodological naturalism would be naturalistic orthodoxy. Yeah, it is. It, it's become a kind, it's become <laughs> Which a kind orthodoxy, of orthodoxy. Is, yeah. you know, that's a, that's a word that resonates with religion, not science. Yeah, and many people don't realize that, that these conventions are at work within the practice of science. They haven't always been, but this is something that sort of became uh, conventional, if you will, in the late 19th century. And it has, it, 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 in many branches of science, it's not really very pernicious. If you're looking at a, uh, you know, a, a, it, just how things work, and you examine a material system, you're, you're you know, you, you say, well, how does one part of the cell affect another part of the cell, or how does uh, chemical A and chemical, if you put chemical A and chemical B together, what happens that's a material interaction, and you're going to give a material answer. But if you're asking about the origin of something, or if you're asking about the nature of human consciousness or the human mind, um, you, you, you're really asking a question that may admit di a different kind of answer. And if you foreclose that, that uh, an, the, the reality of mind is a possible answer to the explanation for the origin of a system, um, you're, you're, you're shutting yourself off from, from where the evidence might lead. There are, an example I, I used when we talked last time is the, the uh, Rosetta Stone in the British Museum. If you walk into the museum and you look at the, 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 those information-rich markings on that fabulous piece of rock, you've got the, the three different la languages, you know, the, the three texts and three languages, uh, inscribed on the rock, and you say, well, I've got to give a materialistic explanation for this. You could think of wind and erosion or uh, some chemical process, but you're obviously missing what's really responsible. What's responsible is thought, and some, there was a scribe involved, an intelligent agent who, to, who etched those information-rich sequences on that rock, and so we have to take into account the reality of mind in in our own experience and in the world around us. And if our science is so limited that we can't see the evidence of that, even when it's staring us in the face, we're going to miss what's real. Yeah. Now, you, you don't have a problem, I assume, with evolution itself. You just have a problem with them uh, assuming th that there is uh, no intelligent design involved. That's well, your problem. 
Right. Uh, part of this, the, the confusion comes with the definition of evolution, because it can mean several different things. It can mean change over time, and, and, uh, and that can refer to the, the simple fact that life is different now than it was a long time ago. We don't have trilobites or, or triceratopses uh, in, in, our, in the biosphere today. Um, and that's, that's a, a, a simple fact of, of evolution or change over time that everyone accepts. It can also refer to this, the, the observable fact that, uh, that organisms uh, vary over time in response to different environmental conditions. Uh, this is what's so, uh, sometimes called microevolution, the, uh, the, the fact that uh, the Galapagos finches, for example, have changed, uh, experienced minor changes in the shape and structure of their beaks in response to varying weather patterns in, in that location in, in, on the planet, or the, peppered, the famous peppered moths in England, the, where the frequency of dark and light colored moths changed over time. Uh, so that's one meaning of evolution, and no one disputes that. The second meaning is the idea of common ancestry or universal common ancestry. That is a little bit more controversial, um, the, especially the universal common ancestry, the idea that all organisms are connected on this giant tree of life. Um, but that's not even the, the meaning of evolution that proponents of intelligent design are, are disputing. It's the third meaning of evolution, the idea that there's an unguided, undirected process, namely natural selection and random mutations, that accounts for all of the changes that we've seen over the history of life, and it also accounts for the appearance of design in living organisms. This, this is one of the key propositions of what's called Darwinism or Neo-Darwinism, uh, and, and the idea there is that life looks designed, but it's not really designed because there's this unguided, undirected process that produced everything, that produced the appearance or illusion of design. And the proponents of intelligent design, such as myself, want to say, no, there are some appearances of design that are actually the product of, of intelligence, of the, 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 the design is actual, it's real. And one of those appearances of design, which has not been explained away by any undirected, unguided <coughs> mechanism, is the information that's present in DNA. And that information is critical because to build a new form of life, you have to have new code. It's very much like our own computer uh, uh, environment, where if you want to give a computer a new function, you have to re you have to provide new code to the system. And just for simplicity's sake, an all life that's existed to this point had to have code. Absolutely, every and form of points, life that we know and that points is, to intelligence. Right, every form of life we know, even the very simplest forms of one celled uh, uh, bacteria, have have digital information stored in DNA. That information is critical to building the proteins and protein machines that those cells and animals need to survive. And that's the critical issue. Where did all that information come from? In yeah. our experience, we know of only one source of information generally, and that's intelligence. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and then when you start looking at something complicating, complicated like the engineering phenomenon of a giraffe, you, you know, then you start going, wow, there was some really serious intelligence design, design let alone a human brain. And so uh, you begin to see, uh, you know, how do, how do proponents of, you know, uh, the purest... Uh, I would say the orthodox view of evolution that's pervasive today. How do they how do they rationalize it in light of uh, the situation with, um, you know, w when you look at the situation of the laws of the thermal the laws of thermal dynamics? How do, how, do, how does that line up with that reality? Well, um, the, the thermodynamics generally is saying that things move from for, you know, all other things being equal, they tend to move from uh, order to disorder. And uh, the, the, there's been an argument that says, well, that's contrary to evolution because things are moving from disorder to order. But there's an ambiguity in that term order. There, there's a couple different kinds of order. One, one kind of order is, is, um, is this kind of symmetric order you get with it when you drain a bathtub and you see a vortex arising or if you get a nice tornado down there in Texas or something. There are certain kinds of order that arise spontaneously if you pump energy through a system. But they're highly symmetric and, and repetitive, if you will, in their, in their structure. Um, there's another type of order which it, 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 information scientists really don't, they don't call it order. They distinguish it from order. And that's, that's information or complex order where you have an aperiodic, uh, non-repeating sequence that's also performing a function. That's what we have with a section of text. We don't have just, uh, in a, if you open a book of English, you don't have... Uh, 
uh, the, the word T-H-E repeating over and over again. That would be a mantra, not a message. And, uh, and so what we, we, we often see energy pumping through a system generating the spontaneous symmetric order like a vortex or a tornado. What we don't see is putting energy through a system and generating uh, lines of, of informative, uh, meaningful uh, text. You don't write, you don't write code by, by uh, turning a fan on or something and, yeah. and, and hoping to get... Um, so, so that's the kind of order that's, that's present in biology, and that's the kind that we know only arises from intelligence. So that's, that's the real problem, and that's, that, that's less a problem of thermodynamics than it is of, of information. And uh, information is a special, uh, a special kind of what's called negative entropy, and that's, and that's the kind that is really difficult to explain apart from the, the role of intelligence. Yeah, makes makes sense to me. All right, Stephen Meyer, he's our guest. He's the author of Darwin's Doubt. When we come back, much more for you. do want to remind you that the best content here shows up over there at usdailyreview.com. I've now uh, almost finished uh, Stephen's book. It's phenomenal. It's must-reading. Darwin's Doubt, more about it here on The Price of Business. Mm-hmm. 